PVL 3702 Law of Contract Chapter 2 2.1 Introduction Provided the other requirements for validity are met, a contract is formed when the parties reach agreement on all the material terms of the contract. The process of reaching agreement may be brief or drawn out, depending on the amount of haggling that takes place. It involves mutual declarations of intention by parties. These declarations are usually analysed in terms of the rules of offer and acceptance. This A makes an offer to B by proposing certain terms on which she is prepared to contract with B. B either accepts these terms or rejects them. If B proposes some modification to the terms, he may he makes a counter offer, which A must accept or reject. This process of bargaining continues until consensus is reached by one party unequivocally accepting the terms proposed by the other. This analysis in terms of offer and acceptance is a convenient one that can assist greatly in determining precisely when and where a contract is concluded. However, it must not be pushed too far as it is merely an analytical tool. The primary basis of contract is consensus, not offer and acceptance. In many situations, it might be difficult to isolate an offer and an acceptance, or to determine which party is the offerer and which is the offeree. For example, when both parties simultaneously sign the contractual document. Provided it is clear that the parties have reached agreement, this distinction is relatively unimportant. As a general rule, the parties may express their intentions in any form whatsoever, in writing, orally or by conduct, for example, by a nod of the head or by raising a hand at an auction. Even silence can signify agreement, but only in highly exceptional circumstances, for example, where previous dealings between the parties make it reasonable to interpret a failure to respond as the acceptance of an offer. Thus, a contract may be formed tacitly, without any words being used by either party, for example, buying groceries in a supermarket, or more commonly, the offer may be in writing and the acceptance tacit, for example, Driving into a parking garage that has a prominent sign outside declaring parking to be at the owner's own risk. In some cases, contrary to the general rule, the law requires that the party's declarations should take a particular form. For example, sales of land must be in a written deed signed by the parties or their representatives. Similarly, the parties themselves might stipulate formalities for the creation of their contract. These matters will be discussed in chapter 6. Then you can just study that diagram. And then a pause for reflection. Clear offer and acceptance are not the only means to reach consensus and create a contract. A contract offer that invokes an acceptance is not an essential requirement for the creation of a contract. Parties are able to reach consensus by other means that involve an incremental process of varied communications that do not qualify as either an offer or an acceptance. This is the case, for example, in a long-term relational contract where agreement is reached over a long period of time and not at one moment by means of an offer and a corresponding acceptance. That's the end of the pause for reflection. 2.2. The offer. An offer is, quite simply, a proposal to contract. More formally, it is a declaration of intention by one party, the offerer, to another, the offeree, indicating the performance that he or she is prepared to make and the terms on which he or she will make it. An offer is usually addressed to a specific person, but it may also be addressed to a group of people, or even to the general public. The offer of a reward by advertisement is the most important example of an offer to the general public. 2.2.1 Legal Effects of an Offer A contract is a bilateral juristic act founded on agreement, being a unilateral declaration of will by one of the parties. An offer cannot in itself give rise to binding obligations. However, it does have the practical effect of placing the offeree in a position where, by the, 
by the unilateral act of acceptance, he or she can call the contract into being. Until such acceptance, the offerer may withdraw the offer, unless he or she is bound by a separate agreement not to do so. An agreement not to withdraw an offer is known as an option and will be considered below. 2.2.2 Requirements for a valid offer An expression of intention will be regarded as sufficient for the purposes of a legally binding offer only when it meets certain requirements. 2.2.2.1 The offer must be firm. The offer must be a firm one, made animo contra hindi. That is to say, with the intention that its acceptance will call into being a binding contract. This requirement is not fulfilled if one of the parties makes a tentative statement to the other with the intention of sounding the other out in order to find out whether he or she would be prepared to enter into negotiations. Whether a particular declar declaration amounts to a firm offer or is merely a tentative indication of willingness to do business may not always be easy to determine. It is ultimately a question of fact to be decided in the light of all the relevant circumstances. 2.2.2.2 The offer must be complete. The offer must contain all the material terms of the proposed agreement. There cannot be further matters that still have to be negotiated before the overall agreement can take effect. Often, when large contracts are negotiated, various issues have to be settled before the deal can go ahead. In such a case, it is said that, the, that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. In other words, the fact that the parties have reached agreement on issues A, B and C cannot give rise to binding obligations if issues D and E still have to be discussed, and the intention of the parties is that there will be no binding contract until a comprehensive agreement is reached. However, if the intention of the parties is that the preliminary agreement in respect of issues A, B and C should be binding on them, irrespective of whether they ever reach consensus on outstanding issues D and E, then of course the preliminary agreement will indeed constitute a binding contract. If agreement is subsequently reached on issues D and E, the preliminary agreement will be incorporated into and superseded by the more comprehensive agreement. 2.2.2.3 the offer must be clear and certain. The offer must be sufficiently certain. It should be enough for the addressee merely to say yes for a contract to come into being. If the offer is so vague that it fails to provide a reasonably clear indication of what the offerer has in mind, no acceptance of the offer can create a binding obligation because it will be impossible to determine the content of that obligation. For example, if Christine says to Sipo, I will buy your car if it suits me, then Sipo cannot accept the offer because it is too vague. In this case, the agreement would be regarded as void for vagueness. Certainty may accordingly be regarded as one of the requirements for a valid contract and is dealt with such as such in Chapter 8. For present purposes, it suffices to note the following points. First, vagueness must not be confused with ambiguity. If a provision in a contract is capable of two or more reasonable interpretations, the court will have regard to extrinsic evidence and the rules of interpretation of contracts to determine the meaning of the provision. Secondly, the courts are generally reluctant to strike down agreements that were intended to have legal effect. They recognize that business people are not expert drafters and are often content to conduct their affairs with only roughly drawn up and incomplete agreements in hand. Relying on one another's good faith and commercial expediency to make such agreements work. In the case of Malton versus Hanakom, for example, the Appellate Division held that an offer to perform when the offerer's financial position allows him or her to do so is not too vague. 2.2.2.4 The Consumer Protection Act 68 of 2008 The Consumer Protection Act or CPA introduces further requirements in regard to offers. 
First, the offer must be in plain and understandable language. In terms of the CPA, the producer of a notice, document or visual representation that is required to be provided to a customer must provide that notice, document or representation in the prescribed form, if any, or in plain language if no form has been prescribed. The Act also provides that such a notice, document or representation will be regarded as being in plain language if it is reasonable to conclude that an ordinary consumer in the class of persons for whom the notice, document or representation is intended, with average literacy skills and very little experience as a consumer of the particular goods or services, could be expected to understand the content, significance and import of the notice, document or representation without undue effort. Secondly, the offer must disclose whether goods are reconditioned or grey market goods. In terms of Section 25 of the CPA, a person who offers to supply any goods that have been reconditioned, rebuilt or remade and bear the trademark of the original producer or supplier must indicate conspicuously that the goods have been reconditioned, rebuilt or remade. Third, negative option marketing is prohibited. Section 31 of the CPA provides that a supplier may not promote any goods or services on the basis that the goods or services are to be supplied unless the consumer declines the offer. Suppliers may also not offer to enter into an agreement for the supply of goods or services or induce a person to accept any goods or services or enter or amend such an agreement on such a basis. Agreements, including amendments to agreements, entered into as a result of negative option marketing are void. Fourth, consumers have the right to a cooling off period if goods were marketed to them directly. A person who markets goods or services directly to a consumer at a place other than the usual place of business must inform the consumer that, in terms of Section 16 of the CPA, he or she is entitled to rescind any contract concluded by notice of, to the supplier in writing or another recorded manner within five days of the later of either the date on which the agreement was concluded or the date on which the goods were delivered to the consumer. And lastly, catalogue marketing is regulated. According to Section 32, Subsection 1 of the CPA, if a consumer initiates and enters into an agreement for the supply of goods or services, not in person but telephonically or by postal order or fax, and the consumer does not have the opportunity to inspect goods prior to conclusion of the contract, the supplier must disclose the following information to a, to a consumer. The supplier's name and its license or registration number, the supplier's physical address, the sales record information required in terms of section 26, the currency in which the price must be paid, the supplier's delivery arrangements, the supplier's cancellation, return, exchange and refund policies and the manner and form in which a complainant a complaint may be lodged. 2.2.3 Offers to the public Offers of reward, advertisements and auction sales present numerous legal problems. Our law, like many other systems, attempts to address these by means of the rules of offer and acceptance. The point of departure is that an offer is usually addressed to a specific individual, but, but that is not necessarily the case. Although one cannot contract with the general public, one can address an offer to the public at large or to a segment of the public and then conclude a contract with specific members of the public who respond to the offer. This was decided in the famous English case of Carlyle versus Carbolic Smokeball Co. The manufacturers of a patent medicine advertised that they would pay the sum of £100 to any person who contracted influenza after having taken the medicine in accordance with the prescriptions of the manufacturer. A customer followed the instructions and shortly afterwards contracted influenza. In an auction for the payment 
of the promised £100, the court decided for the plaintiff on the grounds that the advertisement amounted to an offer to any member of the public and that the offer was accepted by the plaintiff when she complied with these with the conditions mentioned in it. According to this principle, a company that offers a card to any participant in a golf tournament who score, scores a hole in one at a specific hole could be compelled by a court to honour its promise. 2.2.3.1 Advertisements A difficult question arises as to whether an advertisement is an offer. When a business offers goods for sale by way of advertisement, whether in a newspaper, catalog or trade circular, or by displaying the goods in a wind shop window, it is making an offer to the public, so that a contract is formed whenever a person responds to the, to the advertisement by indicating that he or she wishes to accept the offer. Or is the advertisement intended merely as an invitation to do business, so that it is the person responding to the advertisement who in law makes the offer to the business? In the latter case, the result is that when stocks run out, the business can decline to accept the offer. Keep in mind that the statement of intention will not, will not qualify as an offer unless it was made with the intention that the offeree should have the power to create a contract by his or her acceptance. The general rule in our law is said to be that an advertisement constitutes merely an invitation to do business rather than an offer. The authority usually cited in favour of this rule is the old case of Corley v. Rex. A shopkeeper placed a placard outside his shop advertising a particular brand of tobacco for sale at a low price. The appellant entered the, sh entered the shop and bought a pound of the tobacco. He returned later and wanted another pound. The shopkeeper refused his request, apparently believing that he had been sent by a rival shop owner intent on buying up his stocks. The appellant would not leave the shop when asked to do so and was eventually es escorted out by the police. He was subsequently convicted of a criminal offence for remaining unlawfully on premises after being requested by the owner to leave. In his appeal against the conviction, the appellant argued that he had not been on the premises unlawfully, because by accepting the owner's offer to sell the tobacco, he had created a contract between himself and the shopkeeper, and so was entitled to remain in the shop until the contract was carried out. The appeal was dismissed on the grounds that an advertisement was merely an invitation to do business, and that therefore no contract had come into being. One should be wary of reading too much into this decision, which turned on its peculiar facts. Whether a particular statement constitutes an offer depends on what the intention behind the statement was, or on the impression reasonably created by it in the mind of the person to whom it was directed. This rule applies as much to advertisements as to any other statements. It is perhaps no coincidence that today traders advertising goods for sale at a special offer price invariably take care to add in fine print while stocks last. In terms of section 30 subsection 1 of the CPA, bait marketing is prohibited. A supplier may not advertise goods or services as being available at a specified price in a manner that may result in consumers being misled or deceived in any respect as to the actual availability of the goods at the advertised price. If the supplier places a limit on the availability of goods, it must make those goods or services available to the extent of the expressed limit. Okay, a small pause for reflection. Who makes the offer in supermarkets? The South African courts have not yet as yet decided who makes an offer in the case where goods are displayed in supermarkets and prices appear on goods or on the shelves, shelf where the goods are stacked. It has been suggested that, unless there are indications to the contrary, our courts may follow the English case of Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain versus Boots Cash Chemists, Southern Limited. In this case, it was decided that where goods are displayed with a price on the article, the consumer makes an offer to purchase by presenting the article he or she wishes to buy for payment. The shopkeeper therefore makes an invitation to do business and the customer makes the offer to purchase.
2.2.3.2 Promises of Reward It is common for a reward to be offered to any person who performs a certain act. For example, restores a lost article to its owner or furnishes information that would lead to the arrest of thieves. Following the reasoning in the English case of Carlyle versus Carbolic Smokeball Co., the Appellate Division held in Bloom versus American Swiss Watch Co. that the advertising of such a reward might be construed as an offer to the public. The first person who, consciously responding to the advertisement, performed the required act, for example, furnished information to the police, would have accepted the offer and thus become contractually entitled to the to the reward. Of course, for this result to follow, the offer would have to be sufficiently certain. Many offers of reward are so vaguely worded as to be quite unenforceable. For example, when the content or amount of the reward is not specified. 2.2.3.3 Calls for tenders An invitation to the public to submit a tender for work to be done is not an offer that is open to acceptance by the highest tenderer. At most, it is an invitation to potential tenderers to make offers that will be considered after the closing date of the particular tender. 2.3.4 Auctions The cardinal question in regard to auctions is, who makes the offer? Is it the auctioneer or the bidder? In order to determine this, it is necessary to distinguish between a simple auction and an auction subject to conditions, such as with or without reserve. Simple auctions and auctions subject to a condition. When dealing with a simple auction, the most acceptable construction is that the bidder makes an offer that the auctioneer considers and then either accepts or rejects. In terms of Section 45, Subsection 3 of the Consumer Protection Act, this is also the case. As a sale by auction is considered to be complete when the hammer falls, or upon any other customary auction. Until this has taken place, a bid may be retracted. Auctions subject to conditions such as with reserve and without reserve have a different construction. With reserve means that a reserve price is set, a thing is sold to the highest bona fide bidder, provided that the offer is not lower than the reserve price. In this instance, the auctioneer is considered to be inviting purchase purchasers to make offers. Without reserve means that the article will be knocked down to the highest bona fide bidder, that is, a person who bids in good faith. In this instance, the auctioneer is considered to be making an offer to sell to the highest bidder by calling for bids. The effect of auction conditions on the contract. Auction conditions may be advertised beforehand in a newspaper or in a catalogue, or may be po posted up or announced at the auction itself. These conditions are not binding in themselves. If the auctioneer decides that he or she is going to hold an auction subject to certain conditions on the 1st of December and then changes his or her mind after publication of the advertisement, the auctioneer cannot be held liable anymore. He or she becomes liable only when a ground for liability arises. The obvious ground is contractual liability, but the question then to be asked is how a contract between an auctioneer and a bidder is to be construed. It is necessary to keep in mind that there are two potential contracts. First, the contract that binds the parties to the auction conditions, and second, the substantive contract of sale. Construction of an auction held subject to specific conditions. When an auctioneer announce, announces that an auction is to be held under certain conditions, for example, payment in cash on delivery, and that the auction will be held without reserve. He or she is informing potential purchasers that this is the basis on which the auction will be held. Consequently, he or she makes an offer subject to specific conditions. As with any other offer, the auctioneer is free to revoke his offer before it, it has been accepted. This offer is made to undefined persons. The auctioneer does not address his or her offer to any specific bidder and thus any bidder may respond to it. Any person bidding for an article
offered for sale makes it known that he or she agrees to the conditions laid down by the auctioneer and abiding a contract binding the bidder to the auction conditions that is the first contract therefore comes into being the auctioneer's offer in regard to the auction conditions has therefore been accepted and is now binding on both parties in this example, the auction is held without reserve, which means that the auctioneer makes an offer to sell to the highest bidder. He or she is bound to accept the highest bona fide bidder, who is obliged to pay in cash on delivery in terms of the auction conditions. If a potential purchaser makes an offer without acquainting him or herself with the auction conditions, he or she may labour under a mistake regarding the contract, but because the potential purchaser has behaved unreasonably, he or she cannot rely on a an absence of consensus. In terms of section 45 subsection 4 of the CPA, a notice must be given in advance that a sale by auction is subject to a reserve, upset price or a right to bid by or on behalf of the owner or auctioneer. If a notice that the owner or auctioneer has the right to bid has not been given, he or she may not bid or employ any other person to bid at the auction. If this section is contravened, a consumer may approach a court to declare the transaction fraudulent. Furthermore, in terms of section 51, subsection 1A3 and subsection 3, any transaction that subjects a consumer to fraudulent conduct is void. 2.2.4 Termination of an offer An offer terminates in the circumstances described below. 2.2.4.1 Rejection of the offer If an offer falls away, an offer falls away if it is rejected by the offeree, whether expressly or impliedly. An offer is impliedly rejected if the offeree makes a counteroffer, that is, where the offeree, instead of accepting the offer, makes a new offer in return. A qualified acceptance, for example, where the offeree accepts subject to certain conditions being met, will usually be construed as a counteroffer. 2.2.4.2 Death of either party The offer is terminated by the death of either the offer, offerer or the offeree. Since an offer, offer in itself creates no obligations, there is neither a debt that can pass to the estate of the deceased offerer, nor any contractual right that can pass to the estate of the deceased offeree. However, if the offerer has promised not to withdraw the offer, such, as a, promise, such a promise constitutes a contract of option, which is binding on the estate of the offerer, then the, offerer do, the offer does not terminate upon the death of a party. 2.2.4.3 Efflection of the prescribed time or of a reasonable time. The fact that an offer has not been rejected or revoked and has not lapsed as the result of the death of one of the parties does not mean that the offer will remain open indefinitely. That would be unreasonable towards the offerer. Where the offerer has prescribed a time limit for acceptance, the offer, the offer lapses automatically if it is not accepted within the prescribed period. Where no time limit has been prescribed, the offer will lapse after a reasonable time has passed. What constitutes a reasonable time will depend on the facts of the particular case. Note that the inclusion of a time limit for acceptance does not necessarily imply that the offerer may not revoke the offer within that period. 2.2.4.4 Revocation of the Offer Unless the offerer has promised not to revoke the offer for a certain period, in which case one is dealing with an option contract, the offer may be withdrawn at any time prior to its acceptance. Since revocation is an, expressed, an expression of intention, it takes effect only when communicated to the mind of the offeree. This, if the offeree communicates acceptance of the offer to the offerer before learning of the revocation, a contract is concluded. 2.2.4.3 Loss of legal capacity to act If either one of the contracting parties loses the legal capacity to act, the offer is terminated. 2.2.4.6 Acceptance of offer 
Once the offer is accepted by the offeree, a contract comes into being and the offer is terminated. 2.3. The acceptance. An acceptance is a clear and unambiguous declaration of intention by the offeree, unequivocally assenting to all the terms of the proposal embodied in the offer. The offeree's intention to accept the offer may be express expressly stated, for example, I accept your offer, or it may be tacitly indicated, for example, where the offer, offer is made in the presence of the offeree and he or she nods his or her head. As noted earlier, silence cannot ordinarily be treated as acceptance. Thus, the offerer may not force a contract on the offeree by sending unsolicited goods through the post with a stipulation that, unless the offerer hears the contrary within a certain time, he or she will assume that the offeree has agreed to buy the goods. 2.3.1 Requirements for a valid acceptance Acceptance will give rise to the formation of a contract between the offerer and the offeree, provided that certain requirements are fulfilled. 2.3.1.1 The acceptance must be unqualified. The acceptance must be a complete and unequivocal assent to, to every element of the offer. There can be a valid acceptance where the whole offer and nothing more or less is accepted. This is the so-called mirror image rule. If the offeree's acceptance is conditional or contains new terms or leaves out original terms, then there is no clear acceptance and no consensus is reached. A qualified acceptance constitutes a counteroffer, which the off original offerer may accept or reject. For example, Dominic offers D his surfboard for 5,000 Rand cash. D answers, I will buy your surfboard for 5,000 Rand, but I am short of cash and can only pay in six months' time. By this qualification, D rejects Dominique's offer and makes him a counter offer, which Dominique may accept or turn down. An ambiguous acceptance also does not qualify as a valid acceptance. For example, if an example of an ambiguous acceptance is where Dominic offers D his surfboard for 5,000 Rand and D replies, I am very interested and will probably purchase your surfboard, but I must first see if I can afford it. 2.3.1.2 The acceptance must be by the person to whom the offer was made. As noted earlier, where an offer is addressed to an unspecified person, such as the general public, or a class of the public, it may be accepted by any member of the public, or any member of that class. Where it is addressed to a specific person or persons, it may be accepted only by that person or per group of persons. An offer to sell f a farm to A cannot be accepted by A and B jointly, as was held in Bird v. Somerville. In that case, the appellant who who wished to sell his property was informed by an estate agent that the first respondent was interested in buying. The appellant signed a written offer to sell naming the first respondent as sole purchaser. However, the first and second respondents both signed as buyers. At the time of making the offer, the appellant had been unaware of the existent, existence of the second respondent. The court found that although the appellant would not have been prejudiced by both parties buying the property, the appellant was not bound to a contract of sale to both the respondents because he never intended that his offer would be accepted by both of them. A small pause for reflection there. A sessionary may be able to accept an offer. Keep in mind that an offer of reward is an offer addressed to the public in general. Any member of the public may accept it. Where the offerer has made, has granted the offeree an option, but the offeree has not only a right, to, right or competence to accept the offer, but also a right to insist that, insist that the offer be kept open for a duration of the option. If the rights under the option may be ceded to a third party, a sessionary, the sessionary will be able to accept the offer. 2.3.1.3 the acceptance must be a conscious response to the offer. As a matter of logic, a person cannot be said to accept an offer if he, is un he or she is unaware of it.
This point is especially relevant to offers of reward. In Bloom versus American Swiss Watch Co., the respondent company offered a reward to anyone who provided information leading to the arrest of thieves who had stolen jewellery from the company. B furnished such information while ignorant of the offer of reward. When he subsequently became aware of it, he claimed the reward from the company. The court held that he could not recover the reward because until the plaintiff knew of the offer, he could not accept it. And until he accepted it, there could be no contract. For a contract requires that there should be consensus of two minds. And if the one did not know what the other was proposing, the two minds never came together. 2.3.1.4 The acceptance must be in the prescribed in the form prescribed by the offerer, if any. As donimus or initiator of the contracting process, the offerer is entitled to prescribe any method of acceptance he or she sees fit. If the offerer does so, generally no other form of acceptance will suffice. However, in Palais v. Shaikh, the, court of, the Supreme Court of Appeal held that the reliance theory can be applied where acceptance does not take place in accordance with the prescribed mode of acceptance, but where the offeree leads the offerer to a reasonable belief that the prescribed form of acceptance has in fact been complied with. Note further that the offerer may offer, authorize a particular method of acceptance without thereby intending to prescribe it as the only acceptable method. For example, please let me know by return of post whether these terms are acceptable to you. 2.3.2 When and where acceptance takes place Although it is clear that a contract is formed as soon as the offer is accepted, it is necessary to consider rather more closely when such, such acceptance takes place. When parties A and B contract in each other's present, presence inter presentes, presentes, B's declaration of acceptance is communicated directly to A in her presence. Since there is no time lag between declaration and ascertainment of acceptance, there is no problem in determining when and where the contract is concluded. However, when the parties contract at a distance inter absentes, there will, be, there will usually be a time lag between B's declaration of acceptance and A's learning that her offer has been accepted. For example, B posts a letter of acceptance which reaches A only two weeks later. The time lag inevitably raises the question of when B's acceptance takes, takes effect. Is it when B declares his acceptance by writing the letter? or when B posts the letter, or when the letter reaches A's address, or only when A reads the letter and ascertains that her offer has been accepted. The precise time and place of contracting has immense practical significance. For example, the time of contracting will provide answers to questions such as, did B accept in time? Was A's revocation of the offer too late? When did prescription commence running in respect of the debt created by the contract. The place of contracting will be important when the jurisdiction of the court is challenged or when the making of the contract is potentially a crime that can be committed only in a particular province. In the past, the problem has manifested itself most often in the context of postal contracts, where the delay between declaration and ascertainment of acceptance can be lengthy. Today, quicker methods of communication, such as fax and email, are closing the temporal gap. They, in turn, raise new legal questions, not all of which have been answered. The question as to when and where acceptance takes effect is not unique to South Africa and has given rise to various theories in gen general contract literature. First, the declaration theory states that the contract comes into being when and where the offeree expresses acceptance, that is, when he or she writes or signs the letter of acceptance. Secondly, the expedition theory states that the, contracts, the contract comes into being when and where the offeree posts his or her letter of acceptance. Third, the reception theory states that the agreement comes into being only when the letter of acceptance reaches the address of the offerer. 
And lastly, the information theory states that the agreement is concluded when and where the offerer learns or is informed of the acceptance. In other words, when the offerer reads the contract of acceptance. 2.3.2.1 The information theory as the general rule in our law. The information theory holds that the basis for contractual liability is actual and conscious agreement between the parties. Therefore, the offerer must learn of the acceptance of his or her offer before actual consensus can be said to have been attained. Until then, the minds of the parties have not truly met. Since consensus is the primary basis of contract in our law, the general rule is that a contract comes into being only when the acceptance is communicated to the mind of the offerer. 2.3.2.2 Exceptions to the general rule. The information theory does not apply. First, where the offerer stipulates a different method of acceptance. Secondly, in postal contracts. And lastly, in electronic contracts. 2.3.2.3 Where the offerer stipulates a different method of acceptance. The information theory is subject to the qualification that the offerer has dominus, may dispense with the need for acceptance to be communicated to him or her, or can indicate an earlier time when acceptance will be effective to conclude the contract. Such a waiver of the requirement of notification of acceptance may be expressed, or it may be implied from all the circumstances, including the language of the offer and the nature of the contract. This, by way of of example from the case law, the offerer may be held to have tacitly agreed that the contract would be concluded as soon as the offer is signed, or when goods ordered are dispatched by rail, or when written notice of acceptance is delivered to an address, to an address specified in the contract for delivery of all notices under the contract, or in the case of an offer or of reward when the offeree performs some act, such as furnishing information leading to the arrest of a thief or scoring a hole in one in a golf tournament. 2.3.2.4 Postal Contracts The Expedition Theory Applies A very important exception to the general rule occurs in the case of postal contracts. Under the influence of English law, our courts applied the expedition theory as the default rule for postal contracts, rather than the information theory. This is done on the basis of legal fiction, namely that by making an offer through the post, the offerer is deemed not only to have authorised acceptance by post, but also to have waived the requirements of notice, notification of acceptance. In other words, unless he or she indicates otherwise, he or she is presumed to have intended that the contract would be concluded as soon as the letter of acceptance is posted. In the case that, the case that introduced the expedition theory into our law is Cape Explosive Works Limited versus South African and Oil and Fat Industries. Also, Cape Explosive Works Limited versus Lever Brothers South Africa Limited. The SA Oil and Fat Industries wrote a letter from Dalmore in Gauteng to the plaintiff in Somerset Vest in the Cape, offering to sell glycerine to the plaintiff at a certain price. The plaintiff accepted the offer by letter. At a later stage, the plaintiff also accepted by letter another offer to sell glycerine from Lever, Lever Brothers in Durban. Both letters of acceptance were posted at Somerset Vest. In actions on the contracts instituted by the plaintiff in the Cape Provisional Provincial Division, the defendants took exception to the court's jurisdiction on the ground that the contracts were not entered into in the Cape, but in Gauteng and Natal respectively, since that was where the letter of acceptance were received and read by the, by the respective defendants. The court held that a contract was concluded in each case when the letter of acceptance was posted at Somerset Vest. Therefore, the contracts were concluded in the Cape and the Cape Provincial Division had jurisdiction. The court justified this departure from the general rule on various grounds, including first, commercial convenience, the need to protect the offeree who otherwise would be at loss to know when the contract was concluded, and the general 
reliability of the post office, leading to a presumption that a proper, properly addressed letter will reach its destination. Of course, this presupposes the normal operation of the postal services. When those services are disrupted, such as in times of war, the expedition theory would probably not apply. The decision in Cape Explosive Works, as approved by the Appellate Division, without much discussion, in Kerguelen Sealing and Whaling Co. Ltd. v. Commissioner for Inland Revenue. However, it will be seen below, the decision has attracted much criticism, most of it quite justified, and in recent times the courts have seemed eager to distinguish it whenever possible. Whether it will ever be overruled is open to doubt. Small pause for reflection there. The post office is not the agent of the offerer. It should also be noted that the works of Cape Explosive Works that the Cape Explosive Works decision is not based on the assumption that the post office is tacitly appointed the agent of the offerer. This argument was explicitly rejected by the court. 2.3.2.5 The scope of the exception The expedition theory applies only when the following circumstances are present. First, the offer is made by post or telegram. Second, the postal services are operating normally. Third, the offerer has not indicated a contrary intention, expressly or tacitly. And lastly, the contract is a commercial one. The expedition theory does not apply to contracts concluded by telephone or facts. In these cases, where the communication is almost instantaneous and the parties are regarded as being to all intents and purposes in each other's presence, the general rule applies, that is, the contract is concluded when and where the offeree's acceptance is communicated to the offerer. In the case of electronic contracts, the reception theory applies, as discussed below. The expedition theory does also not apply where the offer is made into presentes, even if the parties reside at a dense distance from one another and a reply by post is clearly envisioned. In Smeiman v. Volkers, the parties were together in the office of their common attorney, G, in Cape Town, when V made a verbal offer to S. S returned to the Transvaal to consider the offer. On the final day for acceptance, he instructed G to accept the offer on his behalf. G, being, made, being unable to contract V by telephone to inform him, of the ex acceptance, wrote a letter of acceptance, which was posted before but reached V only after the deadline for acceptance had passed. The court held that no contract had been concluded in the circumstances. 2.3.2.6 Criticism of the Expedition Theory The decision in the Cape Explosive Works case has met with considerable criticism from the legal commentators, the main complaints are listed here. First, although it is true that the offerer may waive the requirement of notification of acceptance, it is a fallacy to assume that he or she does so merely by using the postal system to communicate the offer. The posting of the offer might indicate that a reply by post is anticipated. Not authorized, the offeree does not require special permission to respond by post, but in itself is insufficient to ground a inf an inference of waiver. Secondly, the justification of commercial convenience is unconvincing. Why is it commercially, commercially more convenient to make the offerer rather than the offeree bear the risks of the letter of acceptance going astray? Third, Adoption of the expedition theory implies that a matter, as a matter of logic that a posted acceptance may not be revoked or neutralized by a faster means of communication, such as telegram or fax. This issue will be considered separately below. In ATZ Bazaar Proprietary Limited v. Minister of Agriculture, the appeal court stated that although the decision in Cape Explosive Works had been reinforced in our law 
by long recognition, it was difficult to shut one's eyes to the many criticisms that have been raised against it. Nevertheless, the court stopped short of overruling it. The upshot is a decision that is generally considered to be wrong, but which retains its status as a binding precedent. 2.3.2.7 Revocation or Neutralization of the Posted Acceptance In terms of the expedition theory, the contract comes into being as soon as the offeree posts his or her letter of acceptance. The question arises, what if the offeree wishes to revoke that acceptance? Take note of the following example. Suppose that John Luke, who lives in France, makes an offer by letter to Bongani, who lives in Cape Town, to buy Bongani's wine estate for 30 million rand. Suppose further that Bongani accepts also by letter. Immediately after Bongani has posted his letter, he receives an offer from a German by the name of Dieter for 40 million rand. As Bongani is anxious to, to accept Dieter's offer, he would like to revoke his acceptance of John Luke's offer. In terms of the expedition theory, it, would not, it will not help him to send John Luke a telegram reading ignore letter. It will not even help him to intercept the letter before it reaches John Luke. Because in terms of the expedition theory, the contract came into being when Bongani posted his letter. If Bongani somehow manages to recover his letter, intending to revoke his acceptance, he will be guilty of breach of contract and if he fails to proceed with the sale to John Luke. If he fails to proceed with the sale to John Luke. The question that now arises is whether the expedition theory operates too harshly against Bongani, the offeree. Would it not be fairer if an acceptance could be revoked at any time before it comes to the attention of the offerer. In these circumstances, the information theory appears to be the most equitable. In terms of the information theory, the offerer may revoke his or her offer before acceptance but not after the offeree has communicated his or her acceptance to the offerer. According to the information theory, the contract arises only when and where the offerer learns of the acceptance. The offeree may revoke his or her acceptance at any time before the offerer becomes aware of the acceptance. Okay, pause for reflection. Consider the equities of when a posted acceptance takes effect. In A to Z Bazaar's Proprietary Limit, Limited versus Minister of Agriculture, the court questioned whether the Cape Explosive Works principle, mainly conceived for the protection of the offeree, should necessarily preclude the possibility of neutrali neutralization of a posted acceptance before it is re before it's received by the offerer. Would it not be logically inconsistent to hold, on the one hand, that the contract is concluded as soon as the letter of acceptance is posted, and on the other, that the offeree may nonetheless revoke the acceptance by a quicker means of communication without committing a breach of contract? Should fault not perhaps play a role where the letter of acceptance is delayed or lost in the post? If a letter of acceptance is delayed or lost in the post, this is irrelevant in terms of the expedition theory, because a contract came into being when the letter of acceptance was posted. However, the offerer may be at a disadvantage, since he or she is uncertain whether his or her offer has been accepted. The most equitable solution to the problem might be to determine which party is at fault. If the delay or loss is due to the offerer's fault, for example, because he or she has given the wrong address or has failed to give notice of change of address, he or she should bear the risk and the offeree should be able to rely on the existence of the contract. If the offeree is at fault, for example, because he or she wrote the wrong address on the letter, then the offeree should be able to dispute the existence of the contract even though the offeree has posted a letter of acceptance. Where neither of the parties is at fault and the letter of acceptance does not reach its, its destination, the problem becomes more intricate. One is, one is once again left with the allocation of risk by operation of law if the expedition theory is applied. There should be sound reasons of policy to favour the offeree by applying the expedition theory. That's the end of the um, pause for reflection. 
2.3.2.8 Electronic Contracts The Reception Theory Applies Contracts entered into by means of email, SMS or other means of electronic communications communication are governed by the Electronic Communications and Transactions Act. In terms of this legislation, an agreement concluded between parties by means of data messages is concluded at the, at the time when and the place where the acceptance of the offer is received by the offerer. Consequently, the reception theory rather than the expedition theory applies in the, these circumstances. A data message is regarded as having been received by the offerer at his or her usual place of business or residence when the complete data message enters an information system designated or used for that purpose by the offerer and is capable of being retrieved and possessed by him or her. 2.4. Breaking of Negotiations Parties involved in negotiating a contract are generally free to terminate the negotiations whenever they wish, whenever they so wish. However, negotiations may create the expectation that a contract will eventually come into being. This may have legal consequences where one of the parties has incurred expenditure in preparation for performance under the expected contract and will suffer a loss if the other party terminates the negotiations. In many legal systems, the right to break off negotiations is restricted by normative considerations. It is considered that entering into negotiations creates a certain relationship between the parties that is governed by good faith and objective reasonableness. Each party is expected to have due regard to the legitimate expectations and interests of the other. Breaking off negotiations without some good reason for doing it, so might this result in liability for losses caused to the other party. South African courts have recognized that the principle of good faith applies to pre-contractual negotiations, but the implications of this have still to be worked out. No doubt, parties are still free to break off negotiations for any reason whatsoever. Generally, they will not incur intellectual liability for doing so since a party who incurs expenditure relying upon a representation that a contract will be concluded usually takes a calculated business risk. Nevertheless, it is not too difficult to envisage situations where such reliance might in fact be reasonable, in which case withdrawal from the negotiations might come at a considerable cost in damages. 2.5. Pacta de Contrahendo The formation of a contract by offer and acceptance should now be clear. However, very often in commercial practice, before an offer has been accepted or even made, the parties in enter into an ancillary agreement concerning the main agreement that might follow. For example, A, having made an offer to sell a property to B, might promise not to revoke her offer for a number of days so that B can think the matter over. Or A, not yet wishing to sell her property, might promise B that if she changes her mind and decides to sell the property, she will make an offer to B, affording him the first opportunity to buy the property. These ancillary agreements concerning an offer to conclude another contract are known as Pacta de Contrahendo, contracts about contracting. A Pactum de Contrahendo is simply a contract aimed at the conclusion of another contract. South African law recognizes two forms of Pacta de Contrahendo, the option and the preference contract. An option is an agreement restricting an offerer's right to revoke the offer. A preference contract is an agreement whereby one person binds him or herself to give preference to another person should he or she decide to conclude some other specified type of agreement. This right to be preferred is known as a right of first refusal or where the contemplated agreement is one of sale, a right of preemption. 2.5.1 Options An option is an agreement to keep an offer open for a certain period of time. Being a binding contract, its effect is to make the offer irrevocable for that period. This puts the holder of the option in a very strong position. For the duration of the option, 
the choice is his or hers alone whether or not the main agreement such as sale or lease will come into existence he or she has the power to bring into existence by the unilateral act of exercising the option that is by accepting the offer the holder of the option is thus entitled but not not obliged to conclude the main agreement it is no wonder that the option is such a commercially commercially useful legal instrument consider the following examples number one a offers a car for sale to b at a price of one hundred and thirty thousand rand b would very much like to buy the car but is not sure if she can raise the money to do so she needs time to consider the offer but any delay on her part entails the risk that A might withdraw the offer and sell the car to someone else. So B asks A to give her three days to try to raise the money, during which time A promises not to withdraw the offer. A agrees. B accordingly has an option to buy the car. Secondly, A is selling her house through an estate agent, who shows the house to B. B puts in a written offer by signing a standard form offered to purchase a document drawn up by the agent. The document contains a clause stating that the offer is irrevocable for a period of 30 days. A. This has 30 days in which, the, which to accept or reject B's offer. B must keep the offer open for 30 days. A. This has an option to sell the house for that period. Number 3. A wishes to prospect for diamonds on B's arid farmland in the Northern Cape. The land is worth only 1 million rand now, but A knows that if diamonds are found, it could be worth 100 million rand. Before incurring the expense of prospecting, he wants to be sure that if diamonds are found, he can buy the land for, say, 10 million rand. Accordingly, he offers B the sum of 100,000 rand for an option to buy the land at a price of 10 million rand. B is only too happy to grant A this option, since he gets 100,000 rand immediately and a further 10 million if, for the farm if A exercises the option. A can now do the prospecting secure in the knowledge that if diamonds are found, his 100,000 Rand will prove to have been money well spent. And lastly, ABC Stores is the anchor tenant in a large shopping mall. Its lease is for a period of 15 years, with an option to renew the lease for, lease for a further period of 10 years. As these examples make clear, the option in each case is a legally binding contract that, envis that envisages the, the possible formation of another contract that is the main agreement the option is ancillary to the main agreement which might be a sale a lease or any other type of contract the option might be granted gratuitously or for some consideration such as the sum of one hundred thousand rand in the prospecting example an option to buy is commonly referred to as a call option an option to sell is known as a put option the option might be granted on the understanding that it is exercisable only by the grantee, or it might be transferable to third parties. If it is transferable, the option might have a considerable value, hence the trading options, that is, a form of a derivative contract on the stock exchanges of the world. Consider another example. A has an option to buy 1 million barrels of oil in two years time at a price of $100 a barrel. The price is presently $70 a bar barrel. If the general expectation in the market is that in two years time the price will be $150 a barrel, A could today sell his option for a very high price. 2.5.1.1 Juristic Nature of an Option It is now clearly established that an option comprises of first an offer to enter into the main agreement the main offer and secondly an agreement to keep the main offer open for a certain time the main offer is the subject matter of the option in the same way that a car is the subject matter of a contract for the sale of a car b 
Being a contract in its own right, the option must clearly satisfy all the requirements for a valid contract, including the requirement of consensus. That means that the formation of an option contract may be analysed in terms of offer and acceptance. However, this is potentially confusing, because the analysis will entail the consideration of two offers. The main offer, which is what the option is all about, and the offer to keep the main offer open for a while. That is, the offer of the option itself. Consider this example. If A offers to sell her card to B for 100,000 Rand and states that she will keep the offer open until midnight on Monday, the offer to sell the car is the main offer. The statement about keeping the offer open is an offer of an option, which must be accepted by B, expressly or tacitly, to create the option. Since our law does not recognize unilateral promises as, a bi as binding contracts. Now consider the, the possible responses of B. First, if B immediately accepts or rejects the main offer, the offer of the option will fall away. Secondly, if B says something like, okay, I'll think about it, he has accepted the offer of the option, but not yet the main offer. Third, if before midnight on Monday, B informs A that he accepts the main offer, he has exercised his option and by doing so has concluded the main agreement of sale. Number four, if before midnight on Monday, <clears throat> B informs A that he does not wish to buy her car, he will have rejected the main offer, no sale will come about and the option will be discharged. And lastly, if B fails to respond by midnight on Monday, the main offer will automatically lapse and with it the option. Then there's just a figure that you can study. 2.5.1.2 Earlier views on the nature of an option. The fact that an option is a contract in its own right, albeit un ancillary to the main agreement, has not always been fully appreciated. Some early decisions, including decisions of the Appellate Division, suggested confusion on the legal nature of an option. For example, in Van Pleitzen v. Henning, Solomon stated, When an option is given by a seller, he is bound and cannot withdraw his offer. The contract is a unilateral one and becomes bilaterally bilateral only when the offer is accepted. This statement appears to equate the option with the, mo with the main offer. The unilateral offer is treated as a binding contract that becomes bilateral upon its acceptance. In Boyd v. Nell, the court observed that Solomon could not have considered an option to be merely an offer to sell because he called it a unilateral contract that becomes bilateral when the option is exercised, and then added that that is the correct legal position cannot admit of any doubt. In Hirsch v. Nell, however, Davis was rightly critical of this description of an option as a unilateral contract. The matter is often obscured by speaking of an option as a unilateral contract, which becomes a bilateral contract of sale on its acceptance. This clouds the issue, for it obscures the fact that an option, like any other agreement, has two parties to it. It is no mere offer to sell, it is an agreement seriously entered into, often for a very considerable money consideration, between two contracting parties, and from that agreement legal results flow before it is ever turned into a contract of sale by its exercise. The learned judge after observing that an option has been analysed as comprising an offer to sell, together with an agreement to keep that offer open for a certain time, expressed the view that an option might better be seen simply as an agreement between the giver and holder of the option, by which the giver has bound himself to sell a certain thing to the holder at a certain price if the holder shall require him to do so within the time fixed by the option. By this agreement, the giver grants and the holder acquires a right to buy. And then there's a small counterpoint. Criticism of Hirsch versus Now. To regard an option as a right to buy with a corresponding duty to sell 
is to create the impression that the person granting an option is contractually obliged to make the offer to sell only at the stage when the holder of the option wants to exercise the option, and that is not the case. Moreover, the term right to buy is open to criticism from a legally scientific point of view, as is the description the grantee acquires the right to accept the offer to sell. The grantee has only a power to accept the offer and not a subjective personal right to accept acceptance. Yet, another view is that an option to buy or sell may be regarded as a contract of sale subject to a suspensive condition. The condition being the option holder's decision to exercise the option. The view was rejected by the Appellate Division in Fenter v. Bertschulz. 2.5.1.3 Unilateral declaration that the offer is irrevocable. Is the granting of an option the only way of rendering an offer irrevocable? Or can a unilateral declaration by the offerer have the same effect? Writers have expressed diverse views on this point, and the case law is not harmonious. Since our law does not recognize unilateral promises as binding, in theory the declaration of irrevocability should be treated merely as an offer of an option that requires acceptance if it is to have binding effect. Such, such acceptance may of course be tacit. In practice, offers are frequently declared to be irrevocable, and the offerees seldom expressly notify the acceptance of this offer of irrevocability. To treat their silent as, silence as tacit acceptance of an offer borders on resorting to a legal fiction in order to bring practice into line with legal theory. After a detailed consideration of the conflicting views on this matter, the Labour Appeal Court came to the following conclusion. Where an offer is either expressly or tacitly stated to be irrevocable for a given period and communicated to the offeree, it becomes irrevocable upon receipt unless the offeree rejects the irrevocability. To require a mental acceptance would be meaningless in practice, as <clears throat> that cannot be evidenced. Such requirement would merely pander to theory. To require notification of acceptance of the irrevocability would set a standard which in normal, normal business practice will not be followed and will be regarded as rather foolish. 2.5.1.4 Legal Effect of an Option Being a contract, an option creates rights and duties for the parties. By granting the option, the grantor incurs a dual negative obligation. First, not to withdraw or attempt to withdraw the offer. And second, to do nothing to prevent the coming into existence through the acceptance of the offer of a contract that is capable of being formed, for example, by selling and transferring the property to a third person. The grantee or holder of the option has correlative rights to insist that the offer be kept open and that his or her preferential right to acquire the property through the exercise of the option should not be prejudiced. The effect, therefore, of the option is to render the offer irrevocable. Any attempt by the granter to revoke the offer is not merely a breach of contract. It is also quite ineffectual. The offer remains open for acceptance. The grantee may thus ignore the purported revocation and insist on the full period of the option before deciding whether or not to exercise it. However, he or she would be unwise to sit back and do nothing to protect his or her position, for example, by interdicting a sale to another, since the law will protect third parties who acquire rights in good faith. 2.5.1.5 Duration of the Option Usually, an option agreement will specify the time within which the option must be exercised. Failure to exercise it within the prescribed period will result in automatic termination of the option. An option that fails to specify a time limit may convincingly be void of for vagueness, but the better view is that the offer must be kept open for a reasonable time if no time limit is stipulated. In principle, the death of either party will not put an end to the option, unless the contract stipulates otherwise, expressly or by implication. Where an option is personal to the grantee so that it cannot be transferred, 
it terminates on the death of the grantee. Obviously, an election by the grantee not to exercise the option will cause it to lapse. It will any other as will any other event that puts an end to obligations, such as a supervening impossibility. 2.5.1.6 Transferability of an Option The general rule is that, unless otherwise stated, personal rights may be freely transferred by, ses- by session. Whereby A has granted an option to B, B may cede her rights under the option to C unless A has expressly or impliedly stipulated that the option is personal to B. In determining the in- intention of the grantor A, an important consideration will be whether the identity of the option holder is of any importance to A. In the case of of an option to buy for cash, unless there is something in the agreement to indicate a contrary intention, the option will be presumed to be cedable because the identity of the option holder can be of little importance to the grantor. The option to obtain a loan or to buy on credit would obviously stand on an entirely different footing. 2.5.1.7 Formalities Options to buy or sell land It should be clear by now that contracts might come into play when dealing with an option. The option itself and the main contract created upon exercise of the option. That gives rise to the question whether, if certain formalities are required for the creation of the main contract, they are similarly required for the ancillary contract of option. The question has particular significance in relation to sales of land, which in terms of Section 2, Subsection 1 of the Alienation of Land Act, must be in writing and signed by the parties. In principle, it is difficult to see why, in the absence of some provision to that effect, the option should have to comply with those formalities. After all, it is a contract in its own right, distinct from the ancillary to the main contract. Naturally, the offer that forms the the subject of matter of the option will have to be in writing and signed as well the acceptance of that op- offer which constitutes the exercise of the option. It does not follow, however, that the option itself would have to take the same form. Consider the case where a person makes a written offer to buy a piece of land, and then orally agrees to give the offeree time to consider the offer. Why should that ancillary option be in writing? where the option is embodied in the written offer, as will usually be the case. Why should there be a separate written acceptance of the option offer in order to create an obligation to keep the main offer open? In two provincial cases, there were strong indications that this line of reasoning would be accepted. However, in Hershowitz v. Muhlmann, the appellate division stated unequivocally that, in general, a pactum de contraendo is required to comply with the same requisites for validity, including requirements as to form applicable as to form applicable to the second or main contract to which the parties have bound themselves. This statement is orbiter as regards options, since the case concerned a right of preemption. But it would be a brave litigant who contended that this does not reflect the current law because the court explicitly stated that the principle applies equally to options. 2.5.1.8 Remedies for breach of an option The consequences of a breach of an option are determined by applying the general principles of contract that regulate breach and remedies for breach. These matters are dealt with in detail in chapters 12 and 13. Here we analyse in broad terms how those principles will apply to the breach of an option contract. The general pattern of remedies for breach of contract is as follows. Provided the breach is a material one, the innocent party has an election either to cancel or to uphold the contract. If he or she elects to to cancel the contract, the contract is terminated and the innocent party is entitled to restitution of any performance that he or she might already have made under the contract. If the innocent party upholds the contract, he or she is in principle entitled to an order of specific performance, that is, a a court order compelling the party in breach to honour his or her contractual obligations. 
In other event, whether the innocent party cancels or upholds the contract, he or she is entitled to damages if financial loss resulted from the breach. These damages are measured according to the innocent party's so-called positive interests. That is to say, they are aimed at placing him or her in the financial position that he or she would have occupied had the breach not occurred. Subject to certain limitations that will not be discussed here. Positive interest damages compensate not only for reliance losses, for example, expenditure expenditure incurred in preparing to perform under the contract, which is now wasted as a result of the breach, but also for expectation losses, the net profit that the innocent party would have made had the contract been properly performed. Then you can just study the figure below. These broad principles are now applied to the facts of a particular case. Assume that A has granted B an option to buy a piece of land for 10 million rand. B is a developer interested in developing the land and pays a 400 a 400,000 for the option which is to endure for 6 months. Relying on her rights under the option, B incurs expenditure investigating the feasibility of the development project. For example, on market research, advertising, conducting soil tests, architects plans and legal work in regard to subdivision of the land. Before B has made up her mind whether or not to exercise the option, A commits a material breach of contract by selling the land to a third person, C. B must now elect whether to cancel the option contract or to hold A to it. The consequence of each type of election is outlined below. B cancels the option. If B elects to cancel, the option is terminated with immediate effect, and B is entitled to restitution of the 400,000 rand that she paid for the option. In principle, she is also entitled to damages aimed at placing her in the financial position she would have been had A not breached the option. What her position would have been but for the breach depends on whether or not she would have exercised the option. If B in any event have elected not to exercise it, her expenditure in reliance on the option would, ha would have been wasted anyway, and is this not a loss caused by the breach? Nor has she suffered any loss of profit on the main contract of sale since she would not have gone ahead with the development plans. The only loss that she might perhaps recover is profit of loss on the sale of her option rights to another. But this would depend upon proof that the option was transferable and that she would have been able to sell it at a profit. On the other hand, if B can prove that, but for A's breach, she would have exercised the option, her position would be very much better. Provided she would have at least broken even on her development project, and the court will assume this to be the case in the absence of proof to the contrary. B's expenditure in reliance on the option would not have been wasted and may be recovered as damages. In addition, if B can prove on a balance of probabilities that she would have ma made a net profit on the main contract, that is, by buying the land and developing it as planned, she may recover this loss of profit too. The sum of her reliance loss and her net loss of profit equals the gross profit she will have made but for the breach, and that is the amount to which she is entitled as damages. That is the amount necessary to move her from her present position, having incurred substantial expenses for no gain, to the hypothetical position she would have occupied had A not breached the option contract. B holds A to the option. If B elects not to cancel the option, A's offer to sell the land remains intact because for the duration of the option, it cannot be withdrawn by A. B is entitled to the full period of the option before deciding whether or not to buy the land, and can secure her position in the interim by obtaining an interdict restraining A from transferring the land to C, or doing anything else to prejudice B's right under the option. The grant of such an interdict amounts to an order of specific performance of the option. If or when B decides to exercise the option, the option will be discharged. It will be replaced by a contract of sale of the land. 
B would then be entitled to claim transfer of the land into her name, which would constitute specific performance of the contract of sale as opposed to the option contract. B and C would have competing personal rights to transfer, but since C's claim stems from the option that predated the sale to C, B's claim would be preferred to that of C, on the principle first in time, first in law. A personal claim stemming from an option is not regarded as inferior in law to one stemming from a sale. C would have a claim against A for breach of the contract of sale. If, on the other hand, A had already transferred the land to C, C would be the owner of the property, and as a bona fide successor for value, his real right will prevail over the personal right of B. B would have to be content with a claim for damages against A. However, if C were a mala fide successor, that is, if he took transfer with knowledge of B's prior option, in which the case, in which case the doctrine of notice would apply, C would be compelled to transfer the land to B. According to some authorities, if C were a lucrative rather than an onerous successor, that is, if he acquired the land without having to pay any value for it, which would not be the case if C were a purchaser. C could also be compelled to transfer the land to B. Whether or not B succeeds in a claim for transfer of the land, if she has suffered financial loss as a result of A's breach, she is entitled to damages. 2.5.2 Preference Contract a preference contract is an ancillary, ancillary agreement whereby one person, the grantor, binds him or herself to give preference to another person, the grantee, should he or she decide to conclude another agreement, that is the main agreement. The main agreement will usually be a sale, in which case the ancillary agreement is known as a preemption a preemption agreement, and the right to which it gives rise is known as a preemptive right. Where the main agreement is some contract other than sale, as in a lease, the label preemption is inappropriate and the ancillary contract is usually referred to as one of first refusal. The contract gives the grantee a right of first refusal. For the sake of simplicity, we assume here that the preference contract is a preemption agreement, but the same principles will apply with the necessary changes to all other forms of preference contract. 2.5.2.1 Right of Preemption A right of preemption is a right to be given preference in the event of a sale of property. Its essential nature is that the grantor of the preemptive right is under no obligation to sell the property. The grantee merely acquires the preferential right to buy if or when the grantor decides to sell. It is a conditional preferential right to buy the property. What form the preference takes will depend on the intentions of the parties as expressed in their contract. It might, for example, oblige the grantor A, if she decides to sell the property, to address an offer to the grantee B. Or it might require A merely to notify B that she has decided to sell so that he can address an offer to her. It would seem that the former type is more common and will, in the absence of contrary indications, be assumed to be the common intention of the parties. Then you can just study the figure that follows. 2.5.2.2 Right of preemption compared with an option. The preemption agreement, like an option, is a species of pactum de contraendo. The two concepts are easily confused, particularly when the preemption agreement purports to confer upon the grantee the first option to buy, once the right to preference has been triggered. However, there are significant differences between the two. In the case of an option to buy, the grantor has already made a firm offer to the grantee, and the power to conclude the sale lies exclusively in the hands of the grantee. With the preemption preemption agreement, however, there is as yet no firm offer on the table, merely an undertaking usually to make an offer to the grantee if the trigger event occurs, usually if the grantor decides to sell the property. The grantor ac accordingly retains the power to decide whether or not to sell, and cannot be compelled to do so unless or until the trigger event has occurred. 
Since an option presupposes the existence of a valid offer, there can hardly be an obligation to keep open an invalid offer. In the case of an option, all the terms of the proposed sale must be set out in the offer with sufficient certainty. Otherwise, the offer and whether the option will be void for uncertainty or incompleteness. In the case of a preemptive right, on the other hand, the terms of the potential future sale need not be spelled out in the preemption agreement since there is as yet no firm offer to sell. The preemption agreement itself must have a determined or determinable co content, but the terms of any future sale do not have to be stipulated in advance. Indeed, few potential sellers would be prepared to bind themselves, even conditionally, to a price possibly years in advance of any future sale, where unusually the terms of this proposed sale are spelled out in the preemption agreement. The arrangement might constitute a conditional option in favour of the grantee. Then you can just study that table. 2.5.2.3 The Obligations of the Grantor The particular obligations created by a preemption agreement will depend in the first instance on the terms of that agreement. However, where the parties have failed to spell out their intentions clearly, as is usually the case, one has to fall back upon the default rules of the common law. Unfortunately, those rules are not entirely clear. As with an option, a preemption agreement constitutes a restraint upon alienation since it prevents the grantor from lawfully selling to third parties during the existence of the preemptive right. This it undoubtedly imposes a negative obligation on the grantor, that is, not to sell to a third party without first affording the grantee an option to buy the property. The grantee has a correlative legal right against the grantor that he or she should not sell. Whether it also imposes a positive obligation on the grantor, enforceable once the preemptive right has been triggered, remains somewhat uncertain. In Oceanic v. African Consolidated Theatres Proprietary Limited, Witter expressed the view that it does not, and accordingly the grantor cannot, by order of specific performance, be compelled to sell to the grantee. But Ogilvy Thompson held otherwise. Subsequent cases appeared to prefer the view of Ogilvy Thompson. They recognize that once a trigger event has occurred, the grantor is under a duty to make an offer to the grantee. However, as will be seen below, the question of positive enforce enforcement of a preemptive right by means of an order of specific performance remains uncertain. If a preemption agreement does give rise to an enforceable positive obligation, the content of that obligation will obviously depend on the form of preference envisaged by the parties in their agreement. As noted earlier, the duty will usually be to address an offer to the grantee, but it might instead entail merely inviting an offer from the grantee. 2.5.2.4 The Trigger Event in a Preemption Agreement while the negative obligation of the grantor comes into play as soon as the preemption agreement is concluded, the positive obligation, assuming that there is one, is conditional upon the occurrence of a trigger event. What constitutes the trigger event is a matter of interpretation of the agreement in question, and may sometimes be a matter of difficulty. In the Oceanic case, for example, a leasee's preemptive right to buy the leased property was made conditional upon the lesser desiring to sell the property during the currency of this lease. Before the lease had come to an end, the lesser granted to a third party an option to buy the property, exercisable only after termination of the lease. An appeal court split th three to two on the question whether the leasee's preemptive right had been triggered by the grant of the option, with the majority holding that the right had not been so triggered. If the parties have failed to specify what will bring the preemptive right into operation, the court will have to fall back upon the default construction of preemption agreements, and in this regard it has been argued 
with considerable force that nothing short of a valid offer to or a contract with a third party should suffice as a trigger event. 2.5.2.5 The offer must be a bona fide one. Once the trigger event has occurred, the grantor cannot free him, him or herself of the obligations under the preemption agreement by making an unreasonable offer to the grantee. The offer must be a bona fide one. What constitutes a bona fide offer? First, in the unusual case where the preemption agreement stipulates the terms of the future sale, the offer must be on those terms. Secondly, where a third party has made a genuine offer to the grantor, the grantee must be prepared to match those terms, even if the price is above the market value of the property. Third, where the grantor has shown a willingness to sell to a third party on certain terms, for example, by granting an option to the third party, the offer to the holder of the preemptive right must be on no less favourable terms. And lastly, in the absence of any of the above, what constitutes a bona fide offer can be determined by reference to objective criteria such as the market value of the property and other ascertainable factors. 2.5.2.6 Duration of the offer In Roman Dutch law, the offer made by the grantor had to be kept open for at least two months. Today, unless the parties have agreed otherwise, the offer must be kept open for a reasonable period. This flows from the requirement that the grantor should act in good faith. Where it is not so, the grantor should discharge the preemption agreement by making an offer to the grantee and by then withdrawing it before the latter has had a reasonable opportunity to consider the offer. In Visekerke versus Visekerke, the appellate division decided that if the grantor, having made an offer to the grantee, genuinely changes his or her mind about selling the property at all, he or she may withdraw the offer. In that event, the preemptive right would continue to have effect and the grantor could not sell to a third party in breach of that right. 2.5.2.7 Remedies for Breach the remedies for breach are most easily explained using an example. Assume the following facts. A grants to B a right of preemption and then in breach of the agreement sells the property to C, or grants C an option to buy the property as in Oceanic, without first offering it to B. This is undoubtedly a mat material breach and B has the usual election of either cancelling or upholding the contract. In either event, B is entitled to damages if the breach has caused him financial loss. If B cancels the contract. If B con cancels the contract, the preemption agreement is terminated and B is entitled to restitution of any amount of money he might have paid for the preemptive right. In addition, B may recover as damages may recover as damages the loss of profit he would have made on the main contract of sale provided he can prove on a balance of probabilities that if A had honoured her obligation by making an offer to him, B would have accepted that offer, and also that the ensuing sale would have been a profitable one. Alternatively, if B can prove that, but for A's breach, he would have sold the preemptive rights at a profit, he may recover the loss of profit on that transaction. B holds A to the contract. If B elects to uphold the contract, one would expect that, in accordance with the general principle, he would be entitled to a specific performance of the preemption agreement. Surprisingly, there is still uncertainty as to whether this is in fact the case. As regards A's negative obligation not to sell and transfer the property to another without first giving B an opportunity to acquire, to acquire it, there is no doubt that, in appropriate cases, B is entitled to an order of specific performance. performance. This would take the form of an interdict restraining A from selling or transferring the property to C. What remains uncertain is whether B is entitled to specific performance of A's positive obligation to address an offer to him so that, by accepting it, he can conclude a sale. 
Note that the preemption agreement does not it in itself entitle B to transfer the property, for that B requires valid sale. A valid sale. But how is he to get a sale without A's cooperation? The obvious answer is by obtaining an order of a specific performance to compel A to carry out whatever positive obligation she undertook in the preemption agreement. In principle, B should be entitled as of right to this relief subject only to the court's discretion to refuse it in appropriate circumstances. However, the courts have been strangely reluctant to grant such an order, presumably for reasons associated with freedom of contract. In the Oceanic case, Boeta and Potgieter expressly expressed the view Orbiter, since the case turned on whether the trigger event had occurred, that there can be no positive enforcement of a preemptive right. Only Ogil v. Thompson was prepared to hold otherwise. In subsequent cases, the appeal court has assumed, without deciding the point, that where appropriate specific performances can be ordered. The matter thus remains open. In Associated SA Bakeries Proprietary Limited versus Oryx versus Ver Vereinigte Bakker Eien Proprietary Limited, the appeal court accepted that the grantee of a right of preemption should have some method of positively enforcing his or her right. To expect the grantee to be satisfied merely with a claim for damages in the event of a breach was not in accordance with the date dictates of justice. Instead of simply applying the ordinary principles relating to specific performance, however, the court developed a new doctrine, based on the analogy of the Roman Dutch Naastingsrag. In terms of this doctrine, the so-called Oryx mechanism, when A sells the property to C in breach of a preemptive undertaking given to B, B may step into the shoes of C by addressing a unilateral declaration of intent to A. The effect of this is to create a new contract of sale between A and B on terms identical to those in the agreement between A and C. In a sense, therefore, B can hijack the sale to C. However, despite the misleading terminology relating to stepping into C's shoes, B's unilateral declaration does not put an end to the, to the sale to C. Rather, it creates a new sale to B, which stands alongside the sale to C. Since B's sale flows from the preemption agreement that predated C's sale, the principle first in time, first in law applies and B is entitled to transfer the property in preference to C provided that transfer to C has not yet occurred. C will then have a claim for damages against A. On the other hand, if C has already taken transfer, B's right to recover the property will depend on the principles discussed earlier. If C is a bona fide successor for value, the doctrine of notice cannot apply and B will be the one left merely with a claim for damages against A. The court in Oryx specifically left open three questions. First, whether B can employ his novel mechanism only once A has actually sold the property to C, or whether a mere offer to sell to C will suffice. And secondly, whether the mechanism is competent when the sale must by law comply with certain formalities, as in the case of a sale of land. And lastly, <coughs> whether B can recover the property from C in circumstances where C was ignorant of B's preemptive right at the time of the sale but acquired knowledge of it prior to transfer into her name. These questions remain unresolved. Then there's a small pause for reflection. Um, difficulties with the Oryx mechanism. It is surprising that the courts have hesitated to apply the ordinary principles of specific performance to preemption agreements, and instead have opted for a far more radical Oryx mechanism. This new remedy is almost a form of self-help. Without the intervention of the courts, the guarantee of a preemptive right can unilaterally compel the conclusion of a sale with the defaulting grantor. 
This obviates the need for a court order specifically enforcing the preemption agreement and instead enables the grantee to seek specific performance of the sale that arises from the unilateral declaration of intent. While this shortcut to the ultimate goal of acquiring the property has much to commend it from the point of view of the grantee. It is difficult to reconcile with contract theory and may create more problems than it resolves. The basic theory of consensuality in contract is lacking if a contract of sale may be created by a unilateral declaration by B, unless the declaration can somehow be construed as the acceptance of an offer by A to B. But where, such, where could such an offer be found? B might argue that by offering the property to C, A has tacitly made an offer to him B on identical terms, or A might be deemed in law to have made such an offer to B, although this would rely on a legal fiction which is hardly satisfactory. Or it might be argued that the preemption agreement incorporates a conditional offer to B from its inception and that the offer is triggered by the sale to C. The last argument would require some reconsideration of the legal nature of a preemption agreement, as it would then appear to be a conditional option. And if the terms of the proposed sale were already embodied in the preemption agreement, any sale resulting from the acceptance by a unilateral declaration of intent would have to be on those terms, rather than on the terms agreed by A with C. Where A and B have not explicitly agreed on terms of any future sale to B, the offer embodied in the preemption agreement would be unclear, with its content being determined only when A makes the offer to C. What if the terms offered to C cannot be made applicable to B? For example, where the price is payable partly in cash and partly in the form of shares held by C in a private company. There is much to be said for the view that in such circumstances it suffices if B can substantially match the terms offered to C. With a cash payment being substituted for the portion that B cannot match. But that authority but what authority there is suggested that the Oryx mechanism is competent only if the terms of the offer to C are such that B can step into C's shoes. Is it the Oryx mechanism is the Oryx mechanism competent where the sale must be made in a certain form if it is to be valid? For example, where the preemptive right is in respect of a piece of land. In such a case, the sale itself must be in writing and signed by both parties. According to Hershowitz v. Mulman, the preemption agreement itself must then comply with the same formalities. If both the preemption agreement and the offer by A to C are in writing, will a written unilateral declaration of intent by B suffice to create a contract of sale between A and B? Van Rensberg submits that such a unilateral declaration will indeed suffice, on the basis that the deed of sale may be embodied in more than one document and that, by reading the various documents together, that is, the preemption agreement, the offer to C, and the unilateral declaration by B, there is sufficient documentary evidence in terms of the sale by A to B to satisfy the requirements of the Alienation of Land Act. The courts have yet to, to pronounce on this point. Then you can just study that figure below.